Amen. Let us sing our second song. Open my eyes. Standing with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed them. Therefore, let the entire house of Israel know with certainty that God has made him both Lord and Messiah, this Jesus, whom you crucified. Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and to the other apostles, Brothers, what should we do? Peter said to them, Repent, and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, so that your sins may be forgiven, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the, for the promise is for you and your children and for all who are far away. Everyone whom the Lord our God calls to him and he testifies with many other arguments and exhorted them, saying, Save yourself from this corrupt generation. So those who welcomed his message were baptized, and that day about 3,000 persons were added. In our second reading, a familiar one, is from the 24th chapter of the 
Now on that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem, and talking to each other about all these things that had happened. While they were, were talking and walking and discussing, Jesus himself came near and went with them, but their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, what are you discussing with each other while you walk along? They stood still and said to him. Then one of them said, whose name was Tobias, answered him, are you the only stranger in Jerusalem who does not know the things that have taken place there and in these days? He asked them, what things? They replied, the things about Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet mighty indeed and word before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and leaders handed him over to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one who redeemed Israel. Yes, and beside all this, it is now the third day since these things took place. Moreover, some women of our group astounded us. They were at the tomb early this morning, and when they did not see his body, they came back and told us that they had indeed seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went back to the tomb and found them just as the women had said, but they did not see them. Then he said to them, Oh, how foolish you are, and how slow of heart to believe that all the prophets have declared. Was it not necessary that the Messiah should suffer these things and then enter his glory? Then he Beginning with Moses and all of the prophets, he interpreted to them the things about himself in all the scriptures. As they came near to the village to which they were going, he walked ahead of them as if he were going on. But they urged him to say strongly, saying, Stay with us, because it is almost evening and the day is now nearly over. So he went to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took the bread and blessed it and broke it and gave it to them. Their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he vanished from their sight. They said to each other, Were not our hearts burning within us while he was talking to us on the road, while he was opening the scriptures to us? That same hour they got up, and went back to Jerusalem. The word of God for the people of God. Praise be to God. <laughs> Separating the pieces according to color, like blue in the sky and red in the barn. 
And you know, I would enjoy that separating part of that work. But next comes the tedious work of putting the pieces together and finding out where they go. <clears throat> and that's not me. Now, an important aspect of this is a constant looking at the picture on the box, right? It's essential. And I would think only a puzzle master could assemble the puzzle without the picture. Others separate the straight edge and build the frame. I like that part too. You see, that makes sense because that's orderly and systematically and that matches me. When my kids were young, they enjoyed putting Disney puzzles together on the dining room table. And uh, my daughter was more interested than my son. But I guess like me, he would separate the frame part and put that together, and then he would walk away and tell his sister, you can do the rest, <laughs> which she gladly did in a timely manner. But then there was this one time that I remember that he came to her and said, you can only do the middle of the puzzle because I do the frame for you. And she said, oh yeah? Well, I don't need your help, as a sibling would do. Now, we had already finished the puzzle and put it all the way back in the box. And so he picked up one random piece and handed it to her and, so, and said, okay, do it with this. Start with this piece. Which you would think, who could do that? Well, apparently... Libby, because she assembled the puzzle in about the same amount of time that, he, that we had just done together, and I stood there amazed. And it was at that point that I realized, while both my kids were smart, that they were indeed very different. You see, we don't all process things in the same way. We are uniquely made. And we have unique brains. And it's how uniquely we are created as individuals that addresses how our minds work to process and to help us to achieve our goals. Now, many people follow Jesus, many more than the 12 that we chose to be disciples. Today, we read of two disciples not part of the twelve, lesser known disciples who traveled the road from Emmaus, from Jerusalem to Emmaus, and their conversation centered on everything that had happened in the last days. We might say they were puzzling over all the details of what had happened, trying to make sense out of the events. They seemed to have all the facts, all the pieces. But they didn't know the significance of how each one of them had fit together to see the big picture of putting it all together. They knew that Jesus had been a prophet who found favor with God and with the people. And they knew that he had been arrested and put to death. They even knew that the body of Jesus was missing. When they were joined by the stranger on the road, they freely shared all of these facts. All their hopes and dreams were crushed at the crucifixion. And they were now puzzled. Now, first the stranger doesn't know what happened. They were puzzled by first the stranger not knowing what happened, and second by the tomb being empty. Now, an empty tomb meant that Jesus had been raised from the dead, but they had not come to believe that yet. Instead, they were still overcome by sadness. They were taking that hopeless, slow walk back home, seven miles, a good long time to process what had happened. Maybe it was their grief that prevented them from recognizing Jesus. As far as they knew, this stranger was just another traveler on the road. Strangers traveling alone would often attach themselves to groups for greater safety, 
So perhaps it was no surprise to them to have a stranger join their conversation. The two shared their disappointment as they had hoped Jesus would redeem Israel. But with his death, their hopes were crushed. Jesus was quick to respond in verses 25 and 26. Jesus says, Oh, how foolish you are, and how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets had declared. Was it not necessary that the Messiah should suffer these things and then enter into his glory? Were they just scolded? Were they just chastised for their unbelief? Couldn't Jesus see how deeply they were grieving? The next part is the best part. Well, all of it is the best part, each step along the way. Jesus explains the scriptures to them. Wouldn't you like to have Jesus walking right next to you, explaining to you what the scriptures mean? They had heard the words of the prophets. They had waited for a Messiah. And on this day, they hear the prophecy told to them in the context of Jesus' own suffering and death. Now, we don't know particularly which scriptures Jesus expounded upon. Perhaps it was the prophet Isaiah, chapter 53, where Isaiah foretold his death for the forgiveness of sins. Or maybe Psalm 22, 1, that Jesus quoted from the cross, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Or from the prophet Zechariah, chapter 9, verse 9, who foretold his triumphant entry into Jerusalem with these words, Rejoice greatly, O daughter Zion! Shout aloud, O daughter Jerusalem! Love your king comes to you, triumphant and victorious is he, humble and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. On the road to Emmaus, it was the resurrection event they needed to process. Could they believe it? They needed help to believe. Not unlike Thomas from last week. And they got that help from Jesus. When they arrived at their destination, Jesus continues walking as if he's going on. And they invite and urge Jesus to stay with them. Now here's the best part. At the table, Jesus takes the bread, and he blesses it, and he breaks it. And then that's when their eyes are finally opened, and they see who he is. In the breaking of the bread, the mystery is presented. And in the breaking of the bread, Jesus is revealed. And in the breaking of the bread, their eyes are opened. And when the two realize that it is the risen Lord that is with them, he vanishes. Don't just pass by that part. That's the cool part. He vanishes from them. He has other Resurrection Day encounters to, ha to, to happen. And they turn to each other and they say, this is important. Were not our hearts burning within us while he was talking to us on the road? while he was opening the scriptures to us. Their hearts were burning while they were discussing the scriptures. Isn't that true to life? We may not understand what is happening to us in the moment until we have an epiphany and something is revealed. It is then that we are transformed and changed and can see things in a new light with eyes wide open. You see, for these two disciples, the facts of the story are still the same. Nothing in the event had changed, yet now everything was different. In hearing the words of Scripture and breaking the bread with Jesus, they could finally put all the pieces together. The empty tomb meant Jesus was risen. And they were now witnesses of this resurrection. They could believe in Jesus as their Messiah. They had seen the risen Lord. Jesus had walked with them and talked with them along that road. And then he was present at the table with them. 
Instead of shock and sadness and grief and confusion, these disciples could now join those who had seen the risen Lord. So what did they do? They said to themselves, wow, that was some day. And they went to bed. <laughs> no, that's not what they did. That's not what they could do with all that adrenaline. They had renewed energy. They rejoiced. And then, and this is something that definitely I would struggle with, even though it's evening, even though it's dark, and that's not the time to be traveling on the road, and even though it's seven miles, and even though they had just walked it, they couldn't wait until morning. They started right back on their trip to Jerusalem. They needed to share the good news that Jesus was alive. And to their surprise, when they get there, they find that the other disciples were just as excited as they were sharing the good news. They had, too, seen the risen Christ. And they knew the tomb was empty because Jesus was alive. This was not some story. This was their experience. This was their witness. Their eyes were open to resurrection. <clears throat> This is one of my favorite Easter stories because we learn first of unknown disciples who also participated in post-resurrection events. It's also my favorite because I can put myself in every step of this story. I can see myself being sad and grieved. I can see myself with my heart burning as I'm trying to understand as I hear the scriptures. I can see myself at the table being fed by not only physically, but spiritually from Christ. And I can see myself with my eyes being opened and believing in the risen Christ. And I think it's very cool that Jesus disappeared. He didn't get up and say, okay, see you later, boys. And he didn't turn and say, well, I must be going. And went on to further the ministry of salvation. There are ordinary disciples of Jesus that encountered the risen Christ. People who believed in his mission and his ministry, but could also be confused about the events that take place in the world. People whose faith were fragile, like glass that was easily broken and had their hopes and dreams shattered. People who weren't able to recognize Jesus even when he walked right beside them. People who needed the scripture explained. People who needed to see Jesus in the breaking of the bread. In other words, there are ordinary people like us. Many of us are also familiar with the facts of life of Jesus' life, death, and resurrection, but beyond the basic facts, how hard do we try to find the significance for ourselves in the ordinary disciples living day by day today? Are our eyes open to see Jesus, that he is alive and victorious? Does his resurrection matter to us? You hear me say these words quite a number of times in sermons. Does Jesus matter to you? Does his life matter? Does his teachings matter? Does his death matter? And does his resurrection matter to you? Do we have a desire to have burning hearts to hear him speak? And will we be transformed so we will change the direction of our lives and run with newfound energy to share the good news of Jesus? If you're confused by the things going on in the world or in your own life, you are not alone. But please know that the crucified and risen Christ walks with you. If you have broken dreams and disappointments that make you stand still and feel sad, or you are in the process of grief and pain, please know that the crucified and risen Christ can bring you peace and comfort and transformation to you. 
If you're going on your way, taking a slow walk away from God, you can change that direction and come to Jesus for forgiveness, mercy, and grace. Whatever we face in the life or death, Jesus is already there. God's pervenient grace goes before us. We can believe and walk with Jesus in love. Where are you on your faith journey? Are you seeking God to understand the scriptures? Are you willing for your eyes to be open and see the risen Christ? Easter offers us the adrenaline rush of seeing and recognizing the risen Christ so that we too can say, weren't our hearts burning within us while he was talking to us along the road? Easter fills us with joy that doesn't have to end because the day of Easter has passed by. We can walk with Jesus every day and in every way so that our eyes remain open <clears throat> and we can see life through the lens of resurrection so that we can share with our neighbors and our friends what it means to live a life of hope and grace in the presence of the risen Christ. He is risen. He is, he is risen indeed. indeed. Hallelujah. Most holy God, lover of our souls, we thank and praise you for the story of transformation. Ordinary people being changed by the witnessing of the resurrected Jesus. We thank you for this Easter season when we can consider for ourselves what it means to join Jesus in resurrection. It is our hope and our joy, O oh God. We have lived another week and we have shared in joy and sorrow. Many of us have been touched by grief and pain. Others of us have been touched by joy unspeakable. Some of us have wandered aimlessly, wondering what are we to do next. Send to us your Holy Spirit to guide and direct us towards you. Help us to live in holiness as you are holy. And in the example of Jesus, may we live into the fullness of love and life and grace. Lord Jesus, when our way is confusing, sad, or joyous, open our eyes to your presence. Make our hearts burn within us with a desire to know you better and lead us to an ever deeper understanding of your life, death, and resurrection. We pray these and all things in the way of prayer you taught your disciples. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. now comes with time in our service where we want to share our tithes and gifts with God. As God has so richly blessed us, let us give and reach us.
joining the prayer of thanksgiving. God, I praise everything that we have and all that we are is because of your grace, a gift from you. We now return but a portion of the fruits of our labor to be used for your love and purpose. In our giving, help us to be generous in love, grace, mercy, and kindness.